Hello everyone, welcome and thank you very much for joining me for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about top tips for optimal photo sharing. And so once again, thank you for joining me. I am Tim Gray and as I suspect many of you are already aware, I enjoy, well obviously photography, but I also enjoy traveling, capturing images from all over the world, having adventures along the way hopefully, and then sharing those photos. So I imagine, like many of you, sharing your photos is a big part of why you capture photos in the first place. For me personally, one of my primary motivations for capturing photos is essentially to document my experiences. Whenever I see a beautiful sight or I'm having a great adventure, my inclination is to want to capture a photo to record that experience. And then, of course, I enjoy sharing essentially those experiences through my photos with others. And so today we're going to talk about how we can best share to make sure we're putting our best face forward, essentially, in terms of sharing our photos in the best light possible. But before we get started with that, I do want to make sure that I thank Tamron once again for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series, for making all of this possible. And so thank you to Tamron. Be sure to check out, by the way, I know I've mentioned that there is a video in their series, One Location, One Lesson, One Lens, that features me out in the Palouse capturing images in a variety of different scenarios. So you can certainly keep an eye out for that. But there are also another, a bunch of great videos in that series, along with some other series as well. So I certainly encourage you to check out those fun videos when you have a moment. But let's go ahead and dive in to our top tips for optimal photo sharing, sharing your photos in the best light possible. And of course, I suppose it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that optimally, when sharing a photo, you want to start off by having a great photo. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the tips for capturing images to ensure the best quality, for example. And in particular, just making sure that we're capturing great images both from a technical standpoint and a creative or artistic standpoint, so that when we do share our images, they're met with the best response possible. But of course, what makes a good photo? There was an image I recall a while back that I captured, and it featured a couple of adorable young owls, fluffy, fuzzy little owls perched at a barn, and I captured an image that really was not a great photo, but it got a whole lot of attention on Instagram because they were cute, fluffy owls. And so you're not always going to have the response you necessarily expect. I thought I would get fewer likes on that photo than, for example, a photo like this of the pre-dawn color in the sky at a tiny lake in Bavaria in Germany. But you can't always anticipate that, of course. And I think it sort of underscores what is for me one of the most important things to consider when it comes to sharing your photos is that I, ideally I think you should focus on what you want to share. So try not to worry too much about how others will respond to your photos, but instead focus on your own photographic vision, what you want to share with the world. I know some of you have seen this image before, I've talked about it before, about the very first time I presented this to an audience so proud of my photo, and I heard somebody in the front row say, it's not even sharp. And of course, that was the whole point. This is captured with a lens baby, and so it has that sort of fall off on the edges of sharpness, an interesting almost, you know, sort of motion blur type of effect. And I thought it was pretty cool, but this photo didn't resonate with most people who saw it. <laughs> and every now and then I have somebody say that they do like the photo, but more often than not, People agree that it's not my best photo, but it's a photo that has special meaning to me. I was born in Santa Monica. I used to go to the Santa Monica Pier. This is the sign to the, over the entrance at the Santa Monica Pier. And so it's a photo that I enjoy personally, even if nobody else gets it, even if nobody else likes my photo. And obviously, you know, in some cases we might have sentimental photos that aren't very good photos, but we still like them. Those aren't necessarily the ones you might want to share with others broadly. So you still want to consider, you know, whether or not it's a good photo worthy of sharing, depending on the particular outlet through which you're sharing. But at the same time, you know, if 
for example, you're capturing mostly black and white infrared images and sharing those and you get responses from people that they don't care for black and white, they want to see the images in color, well, that's just not your audience. They just can go look at other photographers' images and not worry about yours. It doesn't mean that you should take up color photography just because you've got feedback that people prefer color images because I assure you there are plenty of people out there who very much prefer black and white images. But again, the point being that you should be capturing images for yourself first and foremost, and to some extent sharing images based on your own personal preferences as a photographer. That said, of course, when you're sharing your images, you want to consider your audience. And so a crop duster, for example, and it's actually sort of a funny thought to me because I lead field photography workshops out in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state, which is where this image was captured. These wonderful rolling hills that are, in this case, planted with, with wheat and, of course, a variety of other crops as well. And a buddy of mine is a crop duster in the area, and so he's good enough to let us coordinate with him so that we can photograph him as he's spraying the fields. And it's funny because a while back I would tell my workshop participants all right, we're going to head out and see if we can find a crop duster to photograph. And the response was a bit lackluster. They expressed confusion as to why we would photograph a crop duster at all, in part because they didn't realize how low the pilot was going to be flying and how exciting it could really be. And of course, after we had photographed the crop duster, everyone was exuberant and couldn't wait to do it again. And so you can't always, as I mentioned, you know, sort of take that initial response to be the final answer, as it were. And, you know, at first, when people didn't express any enthusiasm, I thought, well, maybe, you know, it's sort of my fault. I happen to be a fan of aviation, and so anything that flies to me is interesting, and I would be interested in seeing it and photographing it. And I thought maybe I was just putting my bias too much into that workshop experience, but it's just that they didn't know what to expect. They didn't understand what they were in for, essentially. And so to the extent possible, when it comes to actually sharing your photos, you'll want to think about what type of audience you're sharing your images with. What's the context? So you know, are we talking about, for example, sharing on Instagram, where there is a wide variety of different people who are viewing photos there? It's not just photography aficionados. It's not photographers. It's not fans of photography per se, it's people who are having a somewhat, you know, social online experience and it just happens to relate to images. Whereas if you're presenting to a camera club or putting a photo into a photo contest, obviously now we're talking about photographers. And the audience might influence, number one, whether or not you share a photo in the first place or what type of photo you're going to share and also the types of images that you might share through a particular context. And so I think it's worth considering your audience before you make a lot of decisions in terms of who you're sharing and what you're sharing and how you're sharing, essentially. And then, of course, when it comes to those photos, there are some technical considerations. So I want to kind of roll back to the start of our overall workflow in terms of actually capturing images. And to start with, we want to ensure that we have optimal sharpness. And many of you joined me, thankfully, for a recent webinar where I presented my top tips for sharper photos, helping to optimize the sharpness of your images. And so I won't go into detail here other than to say that, generally speaking, unless we're talking about a motion blur, for example, we probably want to ensure that our photos are nice and sharp. And so you might want to go review that presentation if you haven't seen it already. There's a link here on the page, timgray.me slash sharp tips. And that will take you to that particular video, the recording of that webinar presentation on my Tim Gray TV channel on YouTube. And then of course, don't forget the importance of composition. And this really just comes back to that notion of wanting to make sure that we're capturing the best photos possible. And so that obviously means a variety of different things to different people. And one of the things to keep in mind with photography is that it is art after all. And so there's a very subjective quality. 
I mentioned the example of color versus black and white, for example. Even just subject matter. Some people love bird photos and some people are not that interested in bird photos. And the same holds true really for not just those who are viewing images, but photographers as well. Some photographers do nothing but bird photography and love bird photography and other photographers just don't find it interesting. And so naturally we want to have great photos. It's going to be subjective, but there are really some differences between good composition and bad composition where it's not just subjective. We just have, you know, better quality of image depending on that composition. And so, you know, for, for example, having a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. So in this case, that would be the wheat in the foreground, the tree in the middle ground, and the sky in the background, along with those hills in the distance, not centering up a subject. And so there's a variety of things that we can do to try to ensure a good composition overall. And I think in addition to that would be an interesting composition. So trying to find a unique angle to the subject, trying to find a different perspective from which you can capture the image. Just making the photo itself more interesting. It starts, of course, with an interesting subject, but then we need to have good conditions, ideally, in terms of light and weather, but then also a good composition, and of course, good technical quality as well. And one of, I think, the great tips when it comes to ensuring technical quality in an image is to make use of raw capture. And I know this is a standard refrain, but I still find that a great many photographers are capturing in JPEG rather than RAW. And I understand part of the motivation there. JPEG images don't need the processing that RAW captures do. Essentially, a RAW capture is not really an image per se. It's a collection of data that was gathered by the image sensor, and it needs to be interpreted. Whereas a JPEG is an actual image, I could simply download that JPEG from my camera and send it to anyone via virtually any means, and they'd be able to view the image. But of course, JPEG images are smaller, they are processed already in the camera, but they also have shortcomings. There is lossy compression that is always applied to JPEG images. So even with the highest quality settings, you're going to have some potential for JPEG artifacts, for little visual indicators of that compression. In other words, a less than perfect image in terms of overall image quality. In addition, with raw capture, we're taking advantage of the full bit depth of your camera, the full range of capabilities for the camera in terms of tonal values, which translates as well to color values. With a JPEG capture, for example, we have only 8 bit per channel as an option. And so with a black and white image, you would only have 256 shades of gray with a JPEG capture, which I think we could all appreciate does not ensure that we're going to have very smooth gradations of tone in that case. Whereas with a 16 bit per channel image, even in grayscale, we still have over 65,000 shades of gray. Now, of course, not all cameras, in fact, most cameras are not capturing in the 16 bit per channel mode in terms of bit depth. Many are still 12 bit, some are 14 bit, and so you might have, for example, at 12 bit only 4,000 plus shades of gray for a black and white image, but that is still significantly more than 256 potential shades of gray. And so with a raw capture, we have greater quality in terms of that tonal range. That translates into higher dynamic range. We don't have the JPEG artifacts. We've got more flexibility in terms of processing the image after the fact. And that's especially true when it comes to the color adjustments, color temperature adjustment, for example, because we can adjust that after the fact with no penalty in terms of image quality. And so, yes, raw captures represent a larger file size. Raw captures represent a little more work that has to be done in post-processing, but they also ensure optimal image quality, which can translate into a much better experience for those who view your photos later and a much better response to your images as well. Also, when it comes to exposure, when it comes to capturing your image in the first place, I do recommend the practice of exposing to the right. And what that means is exposing so that the histogram is shifted over to the right, essentially to get the maximum amount of detail in an image and the minimum amount of noise. We want the image to be as bright as possible, 
without actually losing any detail in the photo. Keep in mind that in the context of a photographic image, noise is the opposite of information. And the information that we're recording is light. And so we want as much light as possible without losing detail. So as bright as possible without losing highlight detail. And that means that histogram shifted over toward the right. All other things being equal, this will help ensure maximum detail and minimum noise in a photo. But again, just be sure not to clip the highlights, not to lose highlight detail because you exposed so brightly. And that will help improve overall image quality. But yes, it does mean that you're going to have to process the image because probably in many, if not most cases, exposing to the right means the image is a little brighter than you want it in terms of the final look of the image. So you'll have to essentially darken down a little bit in many cases, but darkening down will not result in a loss of quality the way that brightening up an underexposed image that you then brighten up will cause there to be considerable noise. So for example, if you take an image that was captured relatively dark, or even just an image that has dark areas, like a silhouette, for example, and then brighten it up so much that you can see detail in those shadows, and I guarantee you that you will see noise in those shadows, even with the best quality capture to begin with, because there's simply no information there, thus noise. And speaking of noise, of course, another standard tip you might say in terms of minimizing noise and that also translates into helping to maximize detail is to use the minimum ISO setting needed to ensure an otherwise good capture. And that generally translates into using the lowest ISO that you can while still getting an adequately fast shutter speed. That's certainly important if you're hand holding, you want to make sure that you have a reasonably fast shutter speed if you're hand holding. But even on a tripod, I do see a lot of photographers getting a little bit complacent they put their camera on a tripod and assume that they can make a 10 minute exposure and it will be perfectly sharp. But even with a relatively fast shutter speed in terms of a long exposure, so like a one second exposure, for example, you can still get some motion blur if it's windy, for example, or your tripod isn't perfectly stable, or you're not on the most stable platform, maybe on a bridge, for example. And so you do need to make sure that you're always getting a fast enough shutter speed for the conditions, but that also weighs on your ISO settings. So, you know, you're going to need to consider what sort of compromise needs to be made, but whenever possible, try to keep that ISO set to as low a value as is possible for the circumstances. Another issue that relates not so much to how you configure your camera or make use of your camera per se, but making sure that your sensor is clean. And so this is something it's good to check anytime you're heading out on a trip or an important photo outing, and even just periodically checking to make sure that that sensor is clean. I wish that I could say that this image was made in Photoshop, meaning that I captured with a perfectly clean sensor and then added some virtual dust in Photoshop, but that is not what happened. This is an actual photo, and I wish I could say that it was from many years ago before I had learned such an important lesson, but this actually was within the past year. I simply hadn't checked and didn't think because I had been using a single lens for a while, a long-range all-in-one zoom lens, I didn't think that there was the possibility of much dust on the sensor, but boy was I wrong. The sensor was filthy. And since I had stopped down the lens significantly, in this case, probably f22 to get a little bit slower shutter speed so that I could get a motion blur effect from a moving boat, then I suddenly saw. So once you stop down that lens, you're going to see more of that dust if it's there. And of course, in this case, lots of it was there. Fortunately, with an image like this, it's pretty easy to clean up, meaning it's kind of an abstract, there's this blur, and so there's not really that sense of, you know, difficulty in cleaning it up, but still, I would say that keeping that sensor clean is a pretty important one, and checking it periodically, not getting complacent about that. And then, of course, after the capture, then, oh, actually, Joe, I see a question here about auto ISO. Uh, in terms of, I talked about trying to use that minimal ISO setting. So what about auto ISO? This is purely 
subjective, I would say, but I don't personally like ISO set to auto. You can set ranges, so I can say I want, you know, minimum 100, maximum of, you know, 800 or 1600, but I'm not a fan of that because now I've got yet another thing to keep an eye on. And so I usually prefer to set an ISO based on the circumstances. So on a sunny day, 100 ISO is probably great. If it's an overcast day, for example, then maybe somewhere around 400 ISO will be safer in terms of making sure that I get an adequate shutter speed. But I don't like having that ISO bounce around on me. I'd rather set it to something, and I'm already typically using aperture priority in many cases, if not most cases, and so I'm already keeping an eye on the shutter speed that the camera is changing sort of on my behalf, but I don't want to have to then think about ISO in addition to that. So mostly matter of personal preference, I would say, you know, if you're using an appropriate range where you don't have to worry about the ISO getting too high, it's not a terrible thing, but then you might also have the ISO set higher than was really necessary. Uh, and then a good follow-up question from Ron about sensor cleaning. Uh, I, maybe a loaded question here. Is it safe for the average photographer to clean their own camera's sensor? That's a tricky one because it, I consider it to be reasonably safe as long as you're following careful techniques. But of course, one of the challenges when it comes to that sensor is if you do cause a problem, if you do damage the sensor, replacing the sensor is probably going to cost more than it would be than it would cost to replace the actual camera. And so it's a little bit tricky. So I recommend, I see the follow-up question here from Linda about how to clean it. So I guess the safest way, so not necessarily best, but safest is to send it back to your camera's manufacturer and have them perform a cleaning for you. Technically, in most cases, I believe cleaning your own sensor voids the warranty. So if you damage it, there's no warranty coverage. So safest to send it back to the camera manufacturer, but I'm perfectly comfortable. And I know many other photographers, perfectly comfortable. I recommend products from Photographic Solutions. They have sensor swabs along with a solvent that works very well, uh, a cleaning solution for the sensor itself. And so I recommend their products for that purpose if you're comfortable with the cleaning. And certainly watch a video demonstrating how to go about that process, which they do have on the Photographic Solutions website, by the way. Uh, so if you're comfortable, then I do think that it's perfectly reasonable, but you do need to be very, very careful. If you don't want to clean it yourself, I do recommend sending it back. Most camera manufacturers have uh, often referred to as professional services, so Nikon professional services, for example, Edward, or Canon professional services, so that you can send it in and they'll get a repair. Um, and also, I know right now a lot of photo events are obviously not happening, but if you go to a lot of the photo events, once those start up again, very often you'll find that you can have your camera cleaned for you at one of those events as well. All right. Yeah, and so a few follow, a few other questions here about cleaning it. And yes, I do clean my own sensor using those products that I mentioned and making sure then to keep it clean, unlike with this photo here. And then do keep in mind also, you know, checking in the camera certainly works very well. And so stopping down the lens all the way so that you're making sure that you'll see any dust. And then essentially just capturing a photo of an empty subject. So I typically just point the camera at the wall and move it around during the exposure so that any spots on the wall, for example, would be rendered blurry. And then check for dust in that image, zooming in, of course, on the photo. Um, and then Fred's asking about that rocket air pump. I do use that for initial basic cleaning, but really you need the swabs in order to take care of that completely. All right, and can mirrorless sensors be cleaned? Yes, they certainly can. Good follow-up question there as well. And it looks like we've got those questions covered. All right, and so moving right along then, when it comes to optimizing your photo after the capture, one of the most important things that I know a lot of photographers are neglecting, I'm finding. It's not a subject that's getting talked about as much as it used to, but calibrating your display, making sure that what you're seeing on your display is as accurate as possible. And I'll talk more about this in the context of sharing your photos online later, but most displays, right out of the box are typically about a full stop, sometimes more, too bright. And that means that you're making an adjustment based on a very bright display, 
and then you're going to cause the image to be darker than it should be. And so making sure that you're actually making decisions about adjusting your photo from a calibrated and accurate display, both in terms of luminance and color. And it's especially important on the luminance front when it comes to printing. And then as you're optimizing, generally speaking, good attributes in an image, warm color tones, good saturation, and reasonably strong contrast, but don't go crazy. With all of these, make sure that you're keeping it within reason. We don't want a cartoonish looking image, for example, when it comes to saturation. And I know I hear from a lot of photographers that they don't feel that they have a good eye for color. So as they're making their adjustments, trying to optimize the look of their photos, they're not able to get the best, most accurate color in their images. But I think every photographer would recognize that this image is not good. For example, this is too blue and this image is too yellow. And so one of the things that I recommend to help develop your eye for color is to swing your color adjustments. So temperature, color temperature in this particular case, through the extremes, going all the way to a very blue appearance, then to a very yellow appearance, and back and forth and gradually settling down until you get into the range where the color is looking accurate. And then hopefully you'll, number one, get more accurate colors in your photos, but also help develop that eye for color, for spotting color variations that are not quite right. But there's another tip that I can give you as far as evaluating color, and that is to set the saturation to an extreme level, to boost the saturation all the way to its maximum so that we're seeing colors that are closer to the fully saturated primary colors. And then taking a closer look at the image, we can see where there might be some color problems. So back in the distance, in the, on the left-hand side at the horizon there, you might see there's a little bit too much magenta for example, in the image. And so we would wanna deal with that. So boosting that saturation can help you to spot color issues in a photo, colors that appear in places where essentially they should not. And then also be sure to clean up blemishes. And this is a really big one that I find a lot of photographers neglect. I can't tell you how many times, even prints that are matted and framed and hanging in a gallery, and you'll see little blemishes, little evidence of problems that were missed especially along the edges of the photo. So here, for example, a bald eagle, but a seagull decided to make an appearance in the frame. And so with a little help from Photoshop, we can remove that subject that, in this case, that uh, bird, the, other, the unwanted bird from the frame, leaving only our bald eagle and the water. And then similarly, along with you know, blemishes that might distract your viewer when you're sharing your photos, trying to make sure that you're careful about noise reduction. So here, for example, with no noise reduction applied, we can see both in the dark shadow areas and in the texture of the rocks, quite a bit of color noise. And so trying to mitigate that, but not going overboard in terms of especially luminance noise, where we're going to lose texture in the image. And then similarly, when it comes to kind of cleaning up blemishes and problems, would be chromatic aberration, checking especially when you're using a wide angle lens and especially when there's relatively strong edge contrast, looking for, as you can see here along the right edge of the bridge tower, that purple fringing. There's a little bit of cyan fringing up on the top of the tower as well. But then with a little help in this case from Lightroom, we can very quickly and easily resolve those issues. And then Another issue when it comes to sort of image cleanup would be straightening the horizon. And all of this really just relates to visual distractions, things that are going to cause the viewer when you're sharing your photos in any form to possibly focus a little more on what's wrong with the photo rather than what's right with the photo. So straightening out that horizon will take away one of those distractions. And then cropping when you're going to share. So Teresa, I see your question about Instagram and do you use a no crop app sometimes. So when I am cropping a photo and the advice that I typically give when it comes to cropping is that I want to crop based on my personal preference, my aesthetic sense for the image. And when cropping, being very careful, especially to check all of the edges, go all the way around and make sure that I'm not leaving some little blemish, something that's just barely sticking into the frame, for example. And so 
usually I want to crop based on my own aesthetic sense. Sometimes, of course, you might need to crop for a particular frame size. Normally, I prefer to use my own cropping, my own aesthetic sense for the cropping, and then have the image custom matted and framed rather than try to fit the crop to a particular, uh, a particular frame size. And so normally I prefer to crop for purposes of, well, I guess for my own purposes for the image based on my own preference. So this, for example, is how I framed up this image, but then I decided to share it on Instagram. So to Teresa's question, on Instagram, you can only crop to certain aspect ratios and it's especially limited for vertical photos. I guess Instagram just does not like vertical photos. And so I had to crop to this aspect ratio. I left a little bit of reduced opacity here at the bottom so you could see what was cut away. This is the way I had to crop the image for Instagram, or I would have to add some space. And so that's what Teresa is referring to with the question about a no crop app. And so we could add white space essentially around the photo so that we're able to share an image, even a vertical panorama, for example, but then add white space to either side to get it closer to a square. So in the case of Instagram, sharing was originally intended to be only square cropped photos. They've expanded that, but still not giving us full flexibility in terms of the overall aspect ratios. And again, it's especially limited when it comes to vertical images. So you'll have to give some thought to if there are limitations in terms of the way you're sharing the image cropping wise, do you want to respect that aspect ratio or find a way to sort of fake it, such as by adding white space on the sides in the case of Instagram. And then I also find that adding a vignette can add an element of interest to a photo. And so a vignette is typically used in the context of sharing for helping to keep the viewer's eye inside the photo, as it were. It's almost like a vignette forms a bit of a fence that keeps people from having their eyes wander outside the frame. I'm not sure how you know strong a fence that is necessarily, but a vignette can also add a sense of drama to an image and it can even tone down distractions. And so with this photo, for example, with no vignette applied, the flower certainly stands out in terms of color from the background, but now shifting to a vignetted version with a relatively strong but relatively feathered vignette, now we've darkened up those outer areas so that the flower stands out a bit more. So that can make your image, your key subject, stand out better against the background, for example. It can make the image look a little bit more dramatic, for example. And so a vignette in many cases, and it's not for everyone, if you don't like a dramatic look for your photos or that darkened edge effect, then certainly that can be something you'd want to avoid. And of course, for those of us who have you know, long used wide angle lenses, then I would say that you know, we're used to trying to avoid a vignette effect in terms of the light fall off on the edges from a wide angle lens. So adding it back seems a little silly perhaps, but the vignette effect can work very, very nicely. Uh, and Ronnie Sue asks, in this particular case with the subject, the flower off center, would you also make the vignette off center? And yes, I would tend to shift that vignette over to one side versus the other in order to help ensure that I'm, in this case, for example, vignetting the background without vignetting the foreground subject. So certainly something that you would want to consider in terms of how the vignette affects the key subject within the image. And then of course, considering your outlet for sharing photos, where are you going to share your photos? And that might mean printing, it might be printing just to hang on the wall or to put up in a gallery or to offer for sale. You might be entering a photo into a photo contest, which could be a printed image, or it could be a, an online photo contest. You might be sharing through social media. So for example, here showing Instagram, I do tend to share my photos on Instagram as my primary outlet for sharing photos, or at least one of my primary outlets for sharing photos. And so consider where and how you're going to share your images. And in many respects, it depends on your intentions. And so for example, on Instagram, many are looking for as many followers as possible and as many likes on their images as possible. And to be sure, there's some degree of motivation there, but it's more in this case about having an online presence and being able to interact. And so I can post my photos, share my photos on Instagram, and yes, see the number of likes, which can be encouraging or disheartening as the case may be. But I think more importantly that also is then 
seeing the comments and responding to those comments. So one of the things that I like about sharing on social media, for example, sharing online, is that there's a degree of interaction that you might not otherwise get if you just you know, hang a print in a gallery and you're not spending all day hanging out in the gallery chatting with people who are looking at the image. So as much as I know, you know, social media is often seen as being not exactly social, but there is that sort of virtual experience in terms of interacting with others. And Sharon's asking about settings, export settings from Lightroom, which I'll be covering here momentarily, not specifically in the context of Lightroom, but in terms of those overall settings that I recommend using when it comes to sharing your images, uh, exporting the images more specifically, so the various attributes. So we'll get to that here momentarily. All right. And so again, just choosing how you're going to share and thinking about how you're going to share your images in the context of potentially how you would prepare those images. So let's talk about some of those options in terms of how you would prepare your images essentially for sharing in a variety of different formats. And so first, when we're sharing online, generally we would save those images as a JPEG. That's the, I would say, most common format. Or PNG, if the method that you're using to share your image supports the PNG, that's Portable Network Graphics file format, I would say that is superior because we can, with the PNG file, also have a file that is generally compatible across a wide variety of sharing outlets that's a little bit larger file size than a JPEG, but that does not have lossy compression. And so we'll get better image quality with a PNG image versus a JPEG. And Linda is asking here how to share to Instagram from a computer. And this is one of the challenges of Instagram is that you are theoretically at least limited to only sharing to Instagram from a, a, a mobile device, a smartphone, for example. There are ways though, in fact, there is a website service that is called Later. It's later.com, as in post this for me later. And that enables you to schedule posts to Instagram. There are some limitations with a free account, but then you can upgrade to a paid account to have more flexibility, more control over that. And so that's one option. There are ways in your web browser to essentially make your web browser behave as though it were on a mobile device. It's generally used for testing purposes, but that also enables you to share to Instagram. Why Instagram generally does not want you to share from a computer? I, well, obviously it was originally intended as instant sharing in the moment, but that's changed and I wish Instagram would update with that as well. All right, and then when we're printing an image, so JPEG or PNG is great for online sharing or any digital sharing for that matter, so a digital slideshow, for example. When it comes to printing, if you're going to send your source file to someone else to be printed, then TIFF or PSD, or even if you're working on the image yourself. Now, part of this depends, of course, on the software you're using. In Lightroom, for example, you're working with your original raw capture if you're going to print from Lightroom, you don't need to export as a TIFF or PSD, for example. But if you're working in Photoshop or other software, you would want to make sure that you're saving not as a JPEG for printing, for example, but to save as a TIFF or PSD so that we can have the highest image quality possible when producing a print. For online, we need to take into account, of course, the file size limitations there. And so that, that is essentially a compromise in terms of being able to you know, share images in the best quality. But of course, we want to make sure that somebody can actually view the photo. And even though we now have very high speed internet connections, that still doesn't mean that a huge TIFF file is going to load very quickly in a person's web browser. And so we use a smaller file format, and I'll talk about resolution as well here momentarily when it comes to sharing online, and then a higher image quality with a larger file size that goes along with it when we're preparing an image for print. And then bit depth, I talked about bit depth in the context of a JPEG capture. When we're processing our images on the computer, we want to be working in the 16-bit per channel mode. And that's part of the reason, as I mentioned, that raw capture is important. We're capturing in raw, and we want to make sure that we're retaining as much detail in the image as possible. And so working in 16-bit per channel mode especially is important if we're going to be applying relatively strong adjustments to the image. With an 8-bit per channel image, as we start applying adjustments, the smoothness of gradations 
will get worse and worse. And so with an image like this, we have these relatively smooth gradations of color working in 8-bit per channel mode, especially if I needed to apply strong adjustments, would cause the image to start to look problematic. It's a, referred to as posterization. Or many of you perhaps have seen with a black and white image, you start applying tonal adjustments and the sky starts to look banded. So think of this image and the way the hills, these layers of hills, are creating this sort of almost banded experience. Now imagine if a perfectly clear blue sky, except in shades of gray and a black and white image, had this sort of banding effect. And this is pretty close actually to what that posterization would look like, and that can be problematic. And so working in 16-bit per channel mode will help ensure smoother gradations of tone and color Again, especially if you're applying strong adjustments to an image. So we'll bounce back and forth here a little bit between digital sharing versus print so that I can cover these various topics and the differences between the two. But for example, when it comes to sharing digitally, then I recommend converting the image to the sRGB color space. And that will help ensure the best colors. If you're working, for example, in the Profoto RGB color space, color space, which I'll talk about shortly, that gives you the greatest range of colors. But if you then save an image in Profoto RGB and share it online, in most cases, that image is not going to look good at all. And that is because we are essentially working for a digital display preparing an image for a digital display, and a typical monitor display covers the range of approximately sRGB. Some displays now get close to the Adobe RGB color space, but if we're saving with a very large color space, it's not going to get mapped properly in many cases. Many web browsers still default to not having color management enabled, and so sRGB gives us, number one, a color range that is optimal for that digital sharing, and number two, helps ensure reasonably accurate colors is even when color management is not being used, such as is common with a web browser. And uh, Richard has a question here. He says, some labs, some print labs, want a JPEG for printing, and they want sRGB. If they want a JPEG, it's often because of being able to transfer via the internet. They want a smaller file size. I would suggest telling that lab that you do not want them printing from a JPEG because even at a high image quality, you can still very often see some indications of that JPEG compression in the print. You'll get this little grid pattern because with a JPEG, the compression is being applied by breaking the image into blocks of 16 by 16 pixels typically and then simplifying the information within each of those blocks but ignoring what's on the in the next block, what's across the border. And so where those that grid pattern lines up in the image, you'll often see a very faint grid pattern with a JPEG image that can appear in the print. And so I would very strongly recommend not having them print from a JPEG, sending a TIFF file, for example. But some labs will ask for sRGB, and I'll talk about this more momentarily. There are many print labs that use a workflow that revolves around the sRGB color space. They're using printers that specifically operate with a, an sRGB workflow. And in that case, by all means, yes, preparing. But I'll talk about print profiles here momentarily. And just touching back on 16-bit per channel, Ron saying he understands that Photoshop Elements does not allow you to work in 16-bit per channel. Not entirely true you can work now in 16-bit per channel mode in Photoshop Elements, but most of the adjustments are not available. So you'll only have the very basic adjustments. But I do recommend in that case at least doing that. Number one, with your raw processing, making sure that you are working with the raw to optimize as much as you possibly can. And so that gives you, you know, the best initial image quality, and then doing any additional adjustments that are available in 16-bit per channel mode, and then finishing off with converting to 8-bit per channel at that point so you can make full use of Photoshop elements. And then uh, coming back, I mentioned that I share on Instagram, and Kathleen asking, uh, in the recent court ruling, Sinclair versus Ziff Davis Publishing, will you continue to share via Instagram? And I actually have not seen that ruling. 
So I can't make an intelligent reply to that except to say that, yes, I probably still will share to Instagram. Uh, because my sense personally, and everybody obviously is different in this regard, but my feeling is that I'm getting more value from sharing my images in terms of promoting myself as a photographer, for example, letting photographers know that I lead photo workshops and those sorts of things. That to me represents value and the risk of my images getting stolen uh, is not something that I personally worry about too much. Obviously, if you're a photographer where your livelihood is first and foremost selling your images, you're gonna have a different take on that, which I completely understand. And so there are you know, different scenarios depending on your personal sense. But for me, especially because I don't primarily sell my photos, I primarily you know, teach as it relates to photography. And so I'm less concerned about my images being stolen. But again, that's a matter of personal preference. And so for me, it wouldn't be a factor, but again, I've not seen that particular case. So I can't really answer intelligently when it comes to that other than my own general sense. And uh, Lynn is asking, I mentioned that JPEGs by their very nature cannot look as good as a RAW or a TIFF or PSD file, but isn't JPEG the only way to display online or in an email? Not the only way, and I would say a, a PNG file will give you a little bit better image quality compared to a JPEG. It'll just generally be a little bit larger file size. And so that certainly would be one consideration, but the other is the reality of sharing online. You know, it's not as high a quality experience typically compared to a big print hanging on the wall. And of course, I think in the context of sharing online, the viewers are gonna be a little less critical of image quality in that respect. Another issue, and I mentioned calibrating your display. So you calibrate the display so that it's not too bright and now your image looks a little bit darker, essentially. Again, realizing that we're calibrating to a specific target so that we're getting an accurate look. But that also means that the images that you're optimizing are gonna look brighter online than they otherwise would because your display is a little bit darkened, so you're making the image a little bit brighter. But now somebody else's display, because they've not calibrated, and most people who are likely to view your images, unless they are photographers who calibrate their displays, they're not going to have a calibrated display. Their display is probably gonna to be too bright, and so your images can look too bright. Now, of course, the human eye adjusts for this, and so it's not usually going to be a major issue, but not a crazy idea to reduce the brightness a little bit for images that you're going to share online, maybe by as much as half a stop, but not much more than that. Now, I talked about sharing online using the sRGB color space. In general, when you are printing the image yourself, I would work in the Profoto RGB color space. This is the largest of the three standard working spaces. And so if we have an image that we are preparing purely for online, or as I mentioned in some cases, which I'll touch, touch on again in a moment, potentially for print in the sRGB color space, that's the smallest of the three that we typically use. And so when it comes to images that you're printing, Adobe RGB is kind of one of the typical standard profiles, working space profiles, but Profoto RGB is the largest of the three standard working space profiles. Profoto RGB is essentially what Lightroom is using, not strictly the same, but essentially the same. And so that's a good choice. It is available in Photoshop as well, for example. And this is when we're working with our images and optimizing our images. And so, that is primarily ensuring that we have the widest range of color and tonal values available as we're optimizing our photo. But if you're printing it yourself, printing the image yourself, you should just keep it in that color space. Keeping in mind, of course, that the printer will translate the information based on the capabilities of the printer, but then also making sure that you're using the right color profile. So if you're printing yourself, this means, for example, obtaining profiles from the manufacturer of the paper that you're using. If you're having a commercial service print your image, you want to have a conversation with your printer. You wanna have a relationship, ideally, with your printer. So making sure that you're sending your files to them in the best way possible. Again, ideally a TIFF or PSD image, and then with, ideally, a custom profile that they provide to you. Or, when in doubt, Adobe RGB as a color space for that commercial print work. But again, making sure that you're using the right option based on your specific printer because many commercial printers are using physical printers, the printing device, 
that employs an sRGB workflow. So that can absolutely be the right decision in terms of color space. But again, I would be optimizing in something like Profoto RGB and then saving a copy of the image to send to others in terms of preparing the image for that final output in terms of, in this case, for example, the color profile to be used. And then, of course, we want to size the image for that sharing, for the method that we're going to be sharing the image. And so that means resizing. Hopefully it goes without saying. That means resizing a copy of the image, not scaling down your master image and saving it as a smaller file size because now you can't make a big print from it. So saving a copy of your image and resizing. And for digital, that means all you have to worry about are the actual pixel dimensions. You do not need to think about the pixel per inch resolution, often referred to as dot per inch resolution, for example. You don't need to think about the pixel per inch resolution for digital sharing. It's only for printing. And so instead, you would just resize based on how you're going to share the image. As a very general rule, somewhere around 1,000 pixels. Now, if it's just for a blog, then something like 600 to 800 pixels on the wider dimension, the larger dimension, will work great. In some cases, sharing online, the viewer might be able to click on the image to get a larger view, possibly a full screen or even larger view than that, and so you might want to use a larger resolution. Of course, if you're worried about your images being stolen, you want to try to balance this to not have such a huge image that they could print it at a very good quality. Uh, in this case, for example, at 1,000 pixels, you're looking at an image that will print with very good quality at about three or four inches across, potentially a little bit larger than that. So reasonably small print potential in that regard. But again, sizing just based on, think about the display resolution, for example, the overall pixel dimensions of a typical display, and then the size of the image that you want on that display. And you know, keeping in mind, like on a smartphone, for example, you don't need a very large image to be able to fill up that screen. When it comes to preparing an image for print, on the other hand, we do need to think about the pixel per inch resolution. So we're talking not only about the size. So for example, a 10 inch width in order to produce a print on an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper, but also the pixel per inch resolution. For photo inkjet printing, that typically means about 360 pixels per inch. Keep in mind, this is the resolution for the pixels in your image. This does not align with the ink droplet. So you'll see printers promoted as 1440 DPI or 2880 DPI, etc. And so we don't need to concern ourselves with that number. That's just the overall ink issue in terms of how the ink is being laid down on the paper. We want to consider the image data. And most photo inkjet printers are rendering the data at 360 pixels per inch, which is why that's a number that is generally good to use. For commercial printing, very often you'll use a value of around about 300 pixels per inch. But again, it's only with print that we need to consider the actual resolution for the file as well. And then that output resolution, as I mentioned, depends on the specific output. So 360 pixel per inch for photo inkjet, generally 300 in other scenarios. Again, talk to your printer to make sure that you're using the right settings there. And speaking of settings, make sure not to double color manage, meaning if you're printing from Photoshop, for example, you will have Photoshop manage the colors. So in this case, the print dialog, and we can specify the color handling that we want Photoshop to manage the colors, not the printer. But then in your printer settings for your specific printer, you need to make sure to disable color management so that the color data in your image is not being converted twice to the output color space based on the profile that you're using that will cause inaccurate color. And then when it comes to tonal values, make sure that you're compensating for the behavior of your printer. Many printers, even with a perfect profile, will not produce a full range of tonal values. And so you'll often see that in the dark shadow areas that you are losing detail. You know there's detail in those shadows, but it's not visible in the print. And that's because many printers are not able to produce that full range of tonal values all the way down to the, the shadow areas, the darkest shadows. And so the target image here that you see, this is something I created so that I could print this out with my normal print workflow and then evaluate under a very 
bright light, nice bright light, to see what is the darkest value that actually has detail, essentially. And based on that evaluation, I can apply an adjustment for the print. And if you point your web browser at timgray.me slash target, that will take you to a blog post on the Gray Learning blog where you can both download this image but also learn how to put it to use in your workflow. And naturally, when we're sharing our photos, we want to sharpen to get the best overall appearance of sharpness, an optimal level of detail in the photo, but be sure not to over sharpen the image. And I talked about this in the webinar presentation on sharpening, on ensuring sharper photos, and addressed the video course I have, for example, on understanding sharpening. So you might want to take a look at that webinar recording on the Tim Gray TV channel on YouTube. But just be sure, we want to sharpen, and especially when we're printing on an uncoated matte paper, we want to make sure that we're compensating for the loss of sharpness that, that entails. So we do need to over sharpen that type of scenario, but we want to be careful not to overdo it. And so for online sharing, evaluate the image at 100% scale on your display, and that's accurate for purposes of sharing online. For printing, you'll still want to view the image at 100% at actual pixel size, but now you've got to over sharpen in most cases at least a little bit to get a good result in the final print. And related to sharpening is adjustments that help to optimize detail and texture in the photo. And so in the case of Camera Raw or Lightroom Classic, for example, we have the clarity and the texture adjustments. So this image is without any clarity or texture, but now I'll switch to the version with that clarity and texture, and that can really help to enhance the overall appearance of mid-tone contrast and texture and detail in the photo. And so that's sort of an extension of sharpening, a supplement, you might say, to sharpening for an image. And then if we're going to be printing the image, we'll certainly want to consider which paper we're going to use for that printing. And to me, that varies tremendously based not only on your own personal preference, but also based on the image. And so for images that are relatively subtle, relatively low in contrast, relatively low in saturation, to me those are the images best suited for an uncoated matte paper. An uncoated matte paper, of course, is not shiny. It's relatively dull, you might say. And so it's not going to give us the best contrast because there's not as much contrast inherent in the final result. The inks are going to soak into the paper, and so they're not going to be as saturated. Blacks are not going to be as, as dark a black. And so it's best to select images where there's a relative degree of subtlety. Low contrast, relatively low saturation typically will work best. And obviously the mood of the photo relates to that as well. There's also a variety of coated matte papers, and these are typically best for images with a modest amount of texture and detail and with relative subtlety in the color. In other words, we don't have this really vibrant, strong, saturated, contrasty image, but we want to retain a little more of the color and detail than we would get if we printed to an uncoated matte paper. And then for images where we have reasonably good contrast and color saturation, we kind of want to show those off a little bit, then we would look at perhaps a semi-gloss paper or in scenarios where we really want the colors and the contrast and the textures to stand out, then you might look at a glossy paper. My one concern with glossy papers is that the glare from lights can be a little bit distracting, but of course if you're framing that print behind glass, then the glass sort of mitigates that, generally speaking. Uh, obviously you could use museum grade glass to minimize that glare, but point being is that you know with glossy photos, they sometimes to me look a little too shiny, that's mostly a matter of personal preference, obviously. And then don't forget about specialty papers. For example, if you've created a painterly sort of effect in an image, then you might look at a canvas paper to enhance that sort of painterly quality. Metal prints are really, really popular right now as well, and they really do look amazing. They're very, very luminous in their overall image quality. And so I think metallic prints can be very, very wonderful. I find that metal works really well for night photos, for images where sort of there's almost that shiny quality in some respect, photos with a lot of reflections also, with good color saturation and a bit of contrast can work very nice on a metallic print. But the point is to look at some of the various specialty papers that are available. There's some really, really interesting materials that you can print to. And then when you are printing, 
there's a good chance you'll have some frustrations that the colors or the tones aren't looking quite right. And so first and foremost, I would say to make sure that you're using appropriate settings, using proper color management, as I mentioned earlier, also using that printer test to determine whether or not you need to brighten things up a little bit to compensate for the shadows, but then using soft proofing. This is available in Photoshop as well as in Lightroom Classic so that we can select which printer profile we're going to use based on the printer, ink, and paper combination that we'll be using for printing. And then we can get essentially a preview of what will that image look. So on our monitor display, it simulates what the print is going to look like. And then here you see the gray over the very, what was bright colors in the image. That is the gamut warning. That indicates areas that with my current printer, ink, and paper combination, I cannot reproduce accurately. And so if I have very saturated colors, a matte paper will not be able to reproduce all of the colors, whereas then a glossy paper might. So this soft proofing is not only good for troubleshooting when a print doesn't look quite right and figuring out what's going on, it also can be a good way to choose which papers might be best for a given image. And then rounding back to sharing online with social media, I do recommend making full use of hashtags. And I know this has gotten into the common vernacular, essentially. Hashtags, when you share online, essentially serve as keywords. And one of the key things to keep in mind is that people can follow you, for example, on various social media platforms, such as with Instagram in this particular case, but people also follow hashtags. In other words, someone might follow me. I hope, I hope all of you already follow me on Instagram, for example, so that you can see my photos, but you can also follow hashtags based on your interests. And so this image of tulips, of course, someone might follow tulips as a hashtag so that they will see photos of tulips in their feed on Instagram. And so that can help people find my photo even if they don't know about me. And so it's a great way for you to get discovered as a photographer, for example. And then first and foremost, I saved it for the very end, but it is one of the most important things when it comes to sharing, is to enjoy the process of sharing your photos. I, I hope that you're already enjoying, number one, your photography, and then enjoying working with your photos, trying to get the best out of your image in terms of quality and aesthetic, the overall look of your images, and then enjoy that process of sharing your photos with others and try not to take the feedback that you get too seriously. What I would say is embrace the good feedback that you get, the positive feedback, and try your best to just ignore any negative responses because that does happen when we're sharing our images online, of course, from time to time. So just make sure that you're really focusing on enjoying that overall process of sharing your photos. And I talked a bit about color management today, of course. So first off, thank you very much for joining me for today's presentation. I hope that you found it helpful. There are some more questions here, which I'll address momentarily. But also, if you'd like to learn more about color management, I do have a video course, Color Management for Photographers, that guides you through all of these various topics in a lot more detail. You can get the information with a 50% discount included automatically by just pointing your web browser at timgray.me slash color. All right, and then taking a look at some of the questions here, I'll get to as many of these. I know we've run already slightly over time, but I wanna try and cover at least a few of these questions. Uh, so when saving a TIFF as a JPEG in Photoshop, the, you get a dialog that comes up, embed the color profile Profoto RGB. Should that be unchecked? No, it should not be unchecked, but it should not say Profoto RGB. So you don't wanna save a JPEG in Profoto RGB as the color space you would want to convert that to sRGB. And so in the context of Photoshop with this particular question, before you actually save that copy of the image as a JPEG, you could go to the edit menu and choose convert to profile and convert that to sRGB. Again, be sure that when we're resizing or changing to 8-bit per channel mode or converting to a different color space profile, make sure that you're not saving that in your original master image. Make a copy of the image first before saving it with you know, what I would call destructive adjustments, resizing, for example. And thank you, Stephen, sent a link here for that court case that was referenced earlier. I'll definitely take a look at that. Um, and yeah, Michael's asking about the lossy issue. I, at the moment, I don't have an image that I can pull up and show you, 
but I will make a point of covering that. Uh, I'll put that in an Ask Tim Gray email here, actually, Michael, uh, to address that, what to look for, essentially, when it comes to that JPEG issue. Uh, great question Ron asked about the Clarity slider. So I mentioned using that Clarity and even the new or relatively new texture adjustment to enhance detail. And Ron's asking, what's the difference between that Clarity slider and the sharpening adjustment, the sharpening slider. And essentially the difference there is scale. Clarity is happening across a larger scale. So clarity is very similar in concept to sharpening. It's just happening at a larger scale in the image so that it's enhancing overall details and mid-tone contrast, not enhancing right down at the pixel level the way sharpening does. And yeah, so the question, I know this was covered a little bit earlier as well, how I post to Instagram. And so for the most part, I usually do use the app on my smartphone, but recently I've gotten in the habit. I mentioned later.com, which enables you to schedule the posts. And so I will do that so that it's just frankly a little easier to, for example, type a caption and hashtags using a keyboard rather than trying to type that on a smartphone, which is not, I can type reasonably quickly on a keyboard on a computer. I cannot type quickly at all when it comes to my smartphone. And Tim asked about printing for black and white, and I would say in general, it's sort of the same concepts apply, it's just you have to subtract color from the equation. And so I would say if it's a relatively subtle image, then a matte paper. If it's a stronger contrast image, then a glossy paper. Keeping in mind, I tend with black and white to favor a coated matte paper if I'm going to use matte papers at all because with a, an uncoated matte paper, you are not going to have a true black. Even with a coated matte, it's not gonna quite be a true black compared to what you could achieve with a glossy paper. But still, you know, the same concept applies in terms of the tone of the photo and the overall contrast. We would just ignore the color since it's not there with the black and white, at least a proper black and white without a color tint. And then Jerry's asking about hashtags on Facebook. Yes, you can use hashtags in the same manner on Facebook, just like on Instagram. They're historically frowned upon. Using hashtags on Facebook is something that's generally sort of frowned upon. I think that has changed, and so I wouldn't give that too much concern at this point. I'd feel perfectly comfortable using hashtags on, on Facebook. And Norman's asking if I ever provide explanatory text with your image. Yes, that's part of actually why I like using Instagram to share my photos, and the same is true with a variety of other platforms. I do like to tell a little bit of the story behind the photo, or at least give a very basic caption to tell the viewer why, essentially, I thought this was an image worth sharing, or you know what the story is behind the image, and also location. I think it's very interesting. Maybe I'm biased. Well, I know I'm biased because I prefer to share my photos, uh, you know, and so I'd like to share them on Instagram. And so, you know, there's certainly a degree of bias there, but uh, yes, indeed. Um, and then settings for Instagram, so the same general concept, so saving as a JPEG or a PNG file and sRGB as the color space for sure. And in the case of Instagram, because viewers can zoom in a little bit, I usually resize the images to about 2,000 pixels on the long edge, whereas 1,000 pixels would be more typical for kind of a typical web browser-based experience. And then Richard asking, is a virtual copy okay? So this would be in the context of Lightroom. Yes, if you're gonna crop, for example, for specific output. So if I'm, I've cropped my image the way I want it, but now I need to crop differently for Instagram or for a frame, I typically would create a virtual copy and crop that virtual copy rather than the original. Obviously things are a little different in the case of, you know, when we're sharing our images on, you know, something like Instagram, uh, that's going to be a little bit different. But in the context of Lightroom versus Photoshop, for example, in Lightroom, it's not as important to create a virtual copy because it's non-destructive. I could always crop for Instagram, export the image, and then undo that cropping. So there's a little more flexibility there. But generally, yes, I would say that it is best to create a virtual copy in those sorts of contexts. And yes, Tom points out that in most, well, some, uh, and probably most web browsers, you can add an extension to mimic a smartphone so that you can post directly to Instagram. And yes, uh, in Chrome, for example, and in the Safari, Apple Safari web browser, that is an option. In Chrome, I believe it's under the developer settings, but point being is that there are options in uh, some, if not most, web browsers where you can uh, 
simulate a mobile device and that does enable you to share to Instagram. And the crop, David's asking the crop for Instagram for verticals four to four by five is the max. So basically like an eight by 10 aspect ratio for vertical images. And so Lynn asks, if you're already in 16 bit per channel and you convert to black and white, what can you do to reduce banding? At that point, the only thing you can really do to reduce the banding in the first place is to not apply strong adjustments to the image. That's what's going to create the, that banding effect, that posterization effect is very strong adjustments or you know, reasonably strong adjustments with an image that is in the eight bit per channel mode. With 16 bit per channel, it's virtually impossible in the context of a normal workflow to get that posterization banding for a color image. If you oversaturate or if you, you know, apply an extreme amount of contrast, it's possible. With black and white, even with 16 bit per channel, it's reasonably easy. A 16 bit per channel black and white image has a potential of 65,000 plus color, uh, tonal values, I should say, uh, gray, gray values, shades of gray. And so that could be uh, still an issue, just not as, as dramatic an issue as it would be with 8-bit per channel. And then Stephen asks, is there a particular order you use when adjusting dehaze, clarity, and texture? There doesn't need to be. So in the context of Camera Raw or Lightroom Classic, the order of the adjustments doesn't actually matter. And so you could apply those adjustments in any order that you'd like. But I do feel, you know, sort of fundamentally that there is a logical order, <laughs> maybe it's just me, but starting with dehaze, because dehaze I would only apply if I need to try to cut back the haze in the image. So I use that not all that often and on an as needed basis. And then clarity, I do apply, I would say for me personally, to most of my images because I usually like the effect. Not all, it depends on the image. Sometimes I want to retain a sort of subtle look to the photo. And then texture, I only apply when I really want to enhance fine texture. So like a close up of, you know, an old wooden door where I want every little bit of that grit and grain to be uh, visible in that texture. So the order doesn't really matter, but I usually do end up working in that, you know, sort of biggest to smallest order, you might say. All right. Oh, and yes, yeah, Susan mentions, uh, for those of you that are sharing on Instagram and you want to be able to work with images in those non-standard, at least by Instagram standards, aspect ratios, there's an app called Square Ready that allows you to share that image really easily. And let's see here. And yeah, Don asks, is in terms of sharing on Facebook, is PNG better than JPEG? Yes, it's not a dramatic difference because you're not gonna get as close a look when it comes to the potential for the, the JPEG artifacts in the image. So less of an issue to be sure, but something that I still think is, is a, a good idea. All right. Ah, oh, yeah, so, uh, and I'll make this the last question. I know we've gone a bit over time for today, but Doug's question, Douglas asked about, uh, is what happens when you change the color of an existing image? So from Adobe RGB to Profoto RGB, if you're going to a larger color space, essentially nothing happens. You just have more headroom to potentially create additional colors based on the adjustments you apply. If you go down from a larger color space to smaller, so Profoto RGB to Adobe RGB, the colors will remain accurate except for those that fall outside of the gamut, outside of the range of that smaller color space. Those will generally be clipped to the closest matching color. This depends a little bit on the working color space that you have. The, the particular settings that you're using and the rendering intent that you use. So for example, perceptual versus relative colorimetric would create a little bit of a difference there, but in general concept. So you're not getting an inherent advantage by taking an Adobe RGB image and converting it to Profoto RGB. It's best to start with that Profoto RGB right from the start so that you're not clipping any colors in that initial conversion. But still, if you're gonna make strong adjustments, there is a conceptual advantage and the color space does not change the file size. The bit depth does change file size. Going from 8-bit to 16-bit per channel doubles the base file size. There's no such issue with the color space profile. All right, I think there were a couple other questions here, and I will do my best to address those in upcoming Ask Tim Gray email newsletters. So I will take a look at those and try to cover those. So if I didn't get to your question, I, I apologize for that, but I will try 
to get those in an upcoming Ask Tim Gray email newsletter in the next couple of weeks. Uh, feel free to email those questions to me as well if there's a pressing issue. But in the meantime, thank you once again for joining me for today's presentation. Thank you to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series, and I'll hope to see all of you in another upcoming presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Thank you very much.